Okay, so welcome. So this is, uh, I guess, a uh, few attendees, but I hope somebody is also watching online. Uh, so in this talk, I will discuss uh, some research about Android uh, applications that I, we have been doing for uh, for a while, and in particular, we'll talk about Android malware, um, how it looks like, um, some examples, and we try to make some hands-on today, but somehow the adapter is not working, but we still have some slides to give you some impression. And I will, I'm also joined by one of my graduate research assistant, Mohammed um, Arabin Islam, so thanks, uh, thanks to him for contributing uh, some of the slides. Okay, so start with the, uh, some introduction and motivation. Um, as you know, each of us, I think, currently have one or more than one of uh, hand um, devices. Um, and chances are high they are all Android devices. Of course, we know we have Apple devices, right? So um, as of the first quarter in 2018, <coughs> when I looked at some data from IDC, uh, these are some of the places where we gather some statistical data. Uh, I have found that Android still has been maintaining its uh, dominance in the market share, uh, which is currently above 85 percent. All right, um, the nearby uh, competitor is, is still Apple. Uh, Apple is having roughly 15 percent, and there are a few others like Windows and Rim. Uh, so it's, it's still it's a very big uh, place. So these Android devices are capable of running lots of applications. So. Um, did you ever ask ourselves how many apps are there out actually to download and install? Uh, next slide, we'll try to answer that. Uh, in fact, when I looked at statista.com, this is another place where we found some information, how many apps are out there. Uh, we found it's roughly 3.8 million of apps that are available in Google Play, which is a huge number actually, right? Uh, followed by Apple Store, it's also a very big number, I would say, two millions. Then Windows Stores, uh, Amazons, Blackberry, they have some in order of thousands. Uh, this gives us an impression that we have an astounding number of apps of different categories for different purpose and varieties that it comes with. Um, and also, I'd like to tell you that gradually you will see the, um, at least in the perspective of application design developments, there will be more and more of those Android developers that will be needing in the market. Uh, in fact, the revenue just from the mobile apps, they already exceeded uh, 143 billions, I would say, two years ago. So it's much more higher as today. So you can, of course, recognize the, the, the big economy that is there. Uh, now, what's the problem here we are discussing is, um, uh, with the theme is, of course, the Security and privacy, that also brings uh, um, as a consequence. So we are using a lot of mobile apps, but what are the complications or some of the security and privacy concerns that are bringing to us, right? So we wanted to understand some of those. Uh, but I wanted to give you a bit of motivational study, uh, which was done by Meta Intelli. Uh, this is one of a kind of a research think tank. So they actually published a report uh, where actually they first gathered 500 apps randomly from Google Play Store. Um, and once they started examining what they are doing, uh, started labeling them some of the features that are not really good in terms of security. Uh, here are some conclusions I can tell. So out of those 500 apps, 460 were found to have some sort of security risk and vulnerabilities, such as 92% of the apps, they are using non-secure communication protocols means they are transferring data almost in plain text, which is not good. 60% uh, apps were communicating to the blacklisted domains, which is also not good. Uh, and more importantly, some of the apps, they were basically trying to access the content provider or data of another apps, uh, altering the data. So it comes with a, a pretty much a gloomy pictures that shows that if you randomly start gathering those samples, you will see some issues there. Okay, and I think the, 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 the reasons we can attribute to, I mean, some of those, not all, it would be one of them is that the enough awareness may not be there, both the users and maybe also for the people who are developing them. Uh, some advanced vulnerabilities and exploits are also becoming available. Um, uh, particularly, we have been doing a project uh, with the support of National Science Foundation, 
where we are also developing some of those exploits and showing how to uh, secure them in terms of the IPC communication or inter-process communications where multiple apps are running on the same devices. Okay, uh, in this talk, so here my actually talk starts. I just wanted to warm you up why this uh, study is important and having some significance. Uh, first, I would like to go over some examples of malware, spyware classifications. Uh, then I would talk a little bit about uh, default security features that is offered by those Android devices. Uh, followed by um, examples of static and dynamic analysis um, that those are like one of the two most common approaches that are currently being used in the market to detect those malwares and spywares, flag them. Uh, and uh, we also have some one or two hands-on uh, uh, lab wear, but I believe the, somehow the laptop, if, uh, because it did not cooperate, so we still have some slides. Hopefully that will give you some ideas what we are to talk. Uh, so I start with a sample malware. Now this is a malware I actually intentionally developed all by myself. Uh, to expose to a classroom, because that was a classroom um, when I taught, there, that was an undergrad, of course, and some didn't really have an exposure to mobile app development at the time. So what I did is I asked them, if you are interested to calculate the tips, let's say, in, for, for a restaurant or that you are dining out, uh, do you have an app? And if you don't have, then here is an app, you can, you, it's free to use, and please use that. Uh, so, so what happened, they, it started downloading into their devices and it started from that point. So they provided the input as a food total and these are the output boxes once someone pressed the calculate button, right? So um, let's see a uh, use case. So someone uh, put $55 for the food bill and he get a tax and the tip amount and after calculation. Uh, and the tip amount, there are several possibilities. So let's say, uh, consumer or customer choose to uh, uh, selecting this 10% tip options, then these are the numbers that's going to be showing up, right? Okay, so now it's, it looks good. So those numbers look accurate. However, uh, if you look at one of those little uh, pop-up window that comes over there, they're also sending the food amount, $55 to some strange numbers. So this is the extra behavior that a malware is doing here. So what it is doing here is that it is key logging or recording those uh, food total value and passing it to a number that perhaps this user is not interested to send. So that's an example of uh, key logging. Next is uh, say the user wants to choose 15% tip and he is basically calculating the tip options. So as soon as he is calculating, then what is going to happen, suddenly a phone number is going to be dialed. This looks like bizarre, right? Um, and lastly, if the 20% is being chosen, then this user is going to see the result is there, of course, but uh, somehow the list of information, like the people's name, their phone number, and the email from the contact list, they're going to be displayed. This is also an additional behavior done by the malware. So this is an example of a malware. So what is a malware? It gives us an impression that it looks like a seemingly useful application, but when you are using it, it is also doing some additional activities. That's not necessarily uh, intended for, right? Mm -hmm. So these are malware. But hi, uh, th there is a catch though, because that demo was done for a classroom purpose, but in the real world, obviously the real malware, they're not going to show a lot of those visible things, right? So we may not even know that they are recording, mm -hmm. they are actually transmitting the data, uh, they would be very much uh, quietly operating those things. So the malware uh, has, a, has a lot of research in this literature, I would say. Um, uh, and in fact, there are some classifications of malwares. Uh, we have seen several articles. Uh, I'm basically pointing one that was done by a group from UC Berkeley. <coughs> they basically uh, tried to describe a lot of the malware around, around 2011 and 12. Uh, believe me, they are still true for today, so they still applies in this market. Uh, some of those malwares, they basically can send um, unwanted phone calls to the premium numbers, which are 900 numbers. So basically, if those numbers are called, then the customer or the phone owner is going to be charged back. So uh, that's a costly operation, right? Then some malware can do a spyware operation, I mean, secretly logging the activities. 
uh, then we have adware or spamware, which means that you might running an app, but it is also generating a lot of ads for you, which is something you really didn't want it, right? Uh, and it is draining the battery powers and taking a lot of bandwidth and resources. Some malwares are purposefully designed to be a ransomware. So a ransomware is a very popular term these days. I mean, it's getting uh, bigger and bigger in terms of the problems. Uh, we have seen a ransomware, our common vehicle these days to um, affect uh, larger scale operations like, such as hospitals and so on. So ransomware, one common technique for Android uh, platform is that the key guard or the, the keyboard might be disabled. So you, you are trying to get rid of or trying to put your password, but it's not really acting. Uh, even a malware can uh, change the desktop. So it can do a lot of things. And how it's doing all those things, because it is taking the permission from you when it was being installed. Uh, the next thing I'm going to see, um, or I wanted to show you another interesting study done by a research group from North Carolina State University. Uh, what they did, uh, they gathered some, a good number of malware samples, especially from outside <laughs> the US, I would say. Uh, that was uh, 1,260 samples, and they had a project called malgenomeproject.org. The site is still there. Uh, and I happen to have access to this big data set. I mean, it's really huge samples uh, in order of GB in terms of the size and volume of data. Uh, so they defined, or they reclassified them, and at that time they defined different types of malware family based on the activities that they are doing at the time, right? What they found, one site uh, discovery, I would say, is that uh, at repackaged malware, which means that the malware authors, they take the good apps or the popular brand applications, then they repackage them. And they happen to find around 86% into their samples, right? It's a huge number. Okay, so now we have some ideas about malware. Let's move on to the spyware. They are closely related, except the spyware, they have some specific features. For example, a spyware is an app that basically hides itself from the app list, so you don't even see them, right? Uh, you cannot find them in the, the task manager. You cannot even see an icon that typically you see on your application uh, screen or the device screen. Uh, so it's very hard to see or even to detect or even to uninstall or stop them. So it becomes a headache uh, if you happen to have one spyware. So apparently, we actually try to emulate a spyware by ourselves for, uh, for some um, uh, classroom learning experience, I would say. So here is one uh, I, we developed with the help of uh, our research, um, graduate research assistant. Uh, so you can see this is a screen where someone can type a message and send to a number. And if you look at the stop box, these are the numbers. So let's say this is the intended destination or the phone number. Uh, but hey, as soon as each of those numbers are being typed, uh, there, these numbers are going to be recorded and stored in a file. Let's say this file is data.txt file. You are looking at those numbers. Uh, and if you happen to have an access or if you have the right kind of tools and uh, platforms or frameworks available where you can inspect what's <laughs> going on with your file system. I'm sure you would be able to see uh, a special file. This data.txt was created, and you might want to ask this question, why my message has to be then saved or stored into the local device? Because it's just a text message you just wanted to transmit over the network, right? So that's an example of a key logger. This is actually logging your activities through the key stroke. Now, we also found that this spyware has a booming market somehow. There is a website called uh, www.top10spyapps.com slash Android, where you can see the very top 10 popular spyware apps. So, uh, for example, aim a spy, then you have a spy bubble, mobile spy, uh, flexi spy, spyware, and so on. Now, you might ask, who is actually using those spyware? There are some, is there a good reason? Um, and we found that there might be some practical reasons for using those spyware. For example, monitoring your teenager children. So it's very hard, it's a very tough job, right, for the parents. So some of the parents actually purchase this MSPY software and install that to their children's or their teenager's mobile phone devices in a way that they can know exactly where they're calling, where they're messaging, where their, was their locations, and so on. So that's probably have some good reasons to use. 
So I would say that it also has some bad purpose to you. So it's, it's a mixed situation here. OK, now I move to, uh, so we now have some basic understanding of the malware and spyware, and we can go on and on with adware and so on. Uh, uh, but let's take a look at some of the default security features that Android is claiming, or the mm -hmm. Android uh, vendors are claiming that they are offering to us. And we're going to see there is a bit of disconnect with what the features looks like. And really, they are not necessarily relevant to the malware and the spyware that we are seeing these days. So, uh, you know, Android itself is an operating system, right? So if you ever taken a course in operating system, uh, or even if you don't take, you might want to think that operating system comes with some default properties. Uh, some of those properties are part of the security of computer systems. So one of the property that any operating system has in general is called sandboxing. So a sandboxing is a technique where multiple applications can run on the same environment and platform without having to tampering each other's data or getting to access each other's memory uh, without any permission. So it is strictly prohibited. So that means each of the application has its own space. And application one and application two, they really cannot write each other's space. So it's, it's totally. Now, who is monitoring that? It is being monitored by the operating systems, in particular the kernel of the operating systems, right? Um, now, of course, there might be some reason where an app, one application might need to write something for another application, and the process for that is called IPC mechanism or inter-process communication mechanism, and this is also supported by the Android, uh, but we have found that it also comes with this problem, so uh, it is possible that, uh, it's possible to do a man-in-the-middle kind of attacks over there. But this is one of the default security properties that comes with the Android devices. Mm -hmm. Secondly is the Android also comes with, um, here we go. So it comes with the permission list uh, and features. Um, and I think this is the bread and butter of access control system uh, at this moment. And it's also a binary type of access control. Uh, the reason I'm saying it's a binary because for example, if you are interested to use an app in your mobile devices, of course you are installing that and that app might be taking 15 different permissions. Each of the permissions means a privilege level that the app is requesting to you. Either you have to agree with all those 15 or don't agree at all. So uh, chances are high everybody is going to agree with all. They actually people rarely spend time on looking at the list of all the permissions and trying to explain each of those are they needed or whether I'm, I would be feeling secure after giving those permissions. So people agree with all of them. So this is the model right now we are having, uh, not only for Android, but for, for Apple and any other uh, mobile devices, I would say. Uh, this permission-based access control is, is still called a discretionary access control uh, because it's, par it's based on the user's um, um, uh, discretion at this time. Uh, however, if Somebody doesn't know what is a malware or a spyware, uh, he has no clue, he is going to really approve with all those permissions and, and have those mm -hmm. things installed onto the devices and getting to see more uh, outcome of those. Uh, then we have the safe memory management that is also part of the Android device features. It means that um, this device has a very uh, good memory manager which allows to allocate and deallocate of um, memory space based on the need, uh, have a good garbage collection system. Those are all part of the default features. Uh, but in particular, in terms of the security issues, I would say the buffer overflow is never possible. At least as of now, we have not seen an exploit of that. Uh, and buffer overflow is a, is a condition where it is possible, it might be possible to write more than the allocated uh, space of the data buffer, I would say. Uh, and also to prevent many different variations of buffer overflow attacks or exploit, uh, Android uses the and address space uh, layout randomization. Uh, what it means is that when an application starts running, uh, your stack segment, your code segment, your data segment, they're going to be in different, different locations. It's very difficult to predict them. Um, so, and data encryption is another thing that is supported into the Androids. Uh, so actually those malwares, the spyware, uh, they are not taking an advantage or basically exploiting any of those things, unfortunately, right? Uh, then I want to talk about another very interesting feature. Sometimes people get uh, 
uh, I would say, sold to this called app signing. App signing is a feature not necessarily part of the Android device itself, but it is to manage the huge number of developers and contributors who are contributing to the Google Marketplace at this time. So each of them can sign their apps, creating an identity. It is for identity management, I would say. Uh, but having said that, all those malwares, the spywares, they are also signed apps, right? So that's no different. So how are you going to say something is different? So it's not really easy. Uh, and then uh, I think this is one of the uh, slides that's going to talk about how the package or a, an original Android app is repackaged. Uh, so someone can take an app and can decompile that and insert a class file of its interest, uh, which is the extra or additional activities, and then recompile it back and post it to the marketplace with signing and say, hey, this is a, a game app, a very popular one, and you get it for free, so you don't have to pay $10 or $20 a month to subscribe. And people are very happy, yeah, we're gonna do that. And you know, so there are many countries on Earth at this time, they, it's really big popular, including China, someplace in uh, Middle East, Africa, where there is not enough support for infrastructures and you know, the cyber uh, copyright law, cyber laws, they're not still there. Uh, are enforced a, a very good way like the US, EU, Australia, they do. Uh, so you, you will have those customers there. And speaking of the packaging, depackaging, so basically you are dissecting an APK file, which is the core file of an Android install, uh, application installer. You can actually dissect that with an Android APK tool. It's a free tool. Uh, it's currently hosted under GitHub. It's, GitHub is getting very popular. Everything is now on GitHub. Apparently, we used to see that under uh, course.google um, repository. Um, and APK tool, you can use the appropriate switch uh, to decompile and also recompile. So if you do the D flag uh, in the command line, and this is your test uh, installer or the Android application source, it's not the source, it's the installer file. It's a zip file, and it has an extension of APK. So you are going to get all the um, things in a decompress, so you get a folder and you can really browse everything. You can insert some additional class and recompile it back using the B switch. So this is just a screenshot. You can go to this website. Uh, they actually have good tutorial to follow on. All right, so now our next part of the discussion is um, how we can detect those malwares, actually, practically, in a, in a, um, um, and, and how, what kind of tools are available out there. Um, so the two things I'm going to talk, talk today is static analysis and dynamic analysis. But I just want to tell you, these are not the only two. Machine learning is another approach. Artificial intelligence is another approach. Uh, deep learning will be an another approach. Um, you can name a lot. I mean, permission analysis will be another approach. Um, some years ago, I have done a lot of research on information theory-based approach. That's another one, um, and so on. So uh, these two are the one we are actually researching at this time in a project. Uh, so a static analysis, uh, what it means is you, without running the actual program, can we inspect the code and can we find the issues, like a security issues into the code? Would not that be nice? Yes, that would be really nice. As long as we know the pattern correctly, we can capture that. And now here is the challenge we have here, is that typically an app has hundreds and hundreds and thousands of files. How many places are you going to look at? Can you do that manually? It's so, yeah, it would be really, really a cumbersome job, right? So that's why we, we need to find some automation uh, approach. Um, so I would say that Dex to Jar is, is one of the helper tool. It's not necessarily an static analysis tool, but it helps to convert the source from one format to another format. The reason it is very helpful because we have a lot of good tools for Java and Android is a is just a variation of Java, I would say. It's the same thing as Java, no difference. Um, so it basically helps. But however, when we are doing this static analysis, we are also uh, changing the representation of the source code, uh, which is a keyword and the loops and all those things to some sort of abstract models so we can represent a very big things in a small way and also we are not losing our focus, right? So the model is really important for us. So for example, the call graph, control flow graph, those are very two popular examples. One of the things is, for example, the call graph, you are looking at 
what method is following after what, whereas the control flow graph, you are basically looking at the flow of the data or the sequence. Either one is your focus. So you can build them. There are standard methods, technologies. I would say no need to reinvent the wheel. So it's already out there. There might be some tools that you can reuse. Uh, but the thing is whether you are applying it for the problems that we are addressing here. Uh, I think the line-by-line -line code inspection is another approach. If we know some specific interesting methods that we are, uh, we wanted to inspect closely, uh, then we can do that. For example, send text message, this is going to be one of the key API call. That's usually, will be present in an app if it is sending a message to some numbers, right? And you look at those lines and see if there is a hard-coded number because that looks very, very, uh, that would be a suspicious line in this case. This line is going to be uh, calling to a 900 series number with some uh, message and is going to costing to the user of the application, right? Now, a static analysis has advantage. One of the common advantages, I will say, is that it doesn't require installing and executing the app. So you can avoid the hassles of setting up the environment, uh, and you can scale up the operation very easily. It doesn't matter if you have uh, one millions of files, it's just a matter of using the right computers, having the processors and, and memories. So you give them and you know that your model is going to fetch um, the whole things based on that model. Uh, it also comes with a lot of disadvantages. And one of that is false positive warnings. A false positive warnings is not really, really good for uh, security practitioners. Because uh, think about, we are having a fire alarm at this moment, but there's really no fire. And obviously, there will be a cost coming out of that because maybe a fire truck is coming in this way, right? That cost it to the county. So uh, false positive uh, <coughs> warning means that maybe the tool is reporting that uh, uh, there is a problem, security or privacy. But when you are deeply looking into this, inspecting the source files and the relevant factors, you are concluding that, no, actually, there is no uh, threat here because it's not really possible to exploit these things, right? So. Uh, but the reason the tool actually flagged that because it matched with the pattern that we wanted to capture. That's why it flagged that, right? So it's not really the fault of the tool. It would be the fault of the design of the, of the tool. Then I would also like to say that dangerous permissions, sometimes we say that a permission is dangerous, but it's not necessarily the fact because think about uh, sending the text message. So if you want to send a message from an app, it's not necessarily a dangerous operation or it doesn't necessarily represent a malware. The, it could be really, really a necessary aspect of that app, right? So, uh, and then uh, similarly, the dangerous API calls and sometimes the good app, they are using the bad coding practices and so on. Uh, the dynamic analysis part is going to be running an app instead of just statically analyzing the code. So in, this is like a real, uh, activity we are doing here. And how we run, we run in a controlled environment. Sometimes we call an emulator, right? Uh, in particular, it's going to be a virtual machine. So it's, it's going to start the APK and it will allow a tester or some inspector to interact with the app, just like the real way we are interacting, but it is running in a controlled environment. That control environment gives us some additional things. For example, we might be able to see what files are being read, what files are being created, what files are being modified. Even opening the network connections means that uh, whether there is a communication that just opened to uh, third party websites or some unwanted blacklisted domain where the information might be passed on. So this is an example of sandboxing technique. So obviously sandboxing looks very realistic measurement or assessing uh, the threats of a malware, a spyware, and so on. So is, there is no way to say that a sandboxing technique is going to raise a false alarm because if it really tells that a file was being just created or a file being sent to a blacklisted domain is real, it's an accurate one, right? Disadvantage is the, I would say, the emulators may be sometimes unstable. In particular, we are now doing some research on this and we found that sometimes it, we have to work around to do the routing of the device. It means we, we wanted to get the secure the root permissions. So we have to find a workaround. And some of the tools that has been developed by others, others universities and research groups, they have not even up to date their instructions. So we kind of have to discover the things all by ourselves. So we, we, we can say not enough good support there. So it, there are some obstacles and challenges. 
Uh, and there is another one, which is it's not automatic process. You need to generate the event. So what I mean by event is you are interacting with the apps. Sometimes you are clicking the buttons, and you have to make sure you click all kinds of buttons you see in your screen, right? Sometimes you are typing that um, input or numbers or letters. So we might not know whether the typing we are doing, they are actually covering all kinds of possibilities the app could have run. So we really don't know. So it's giving us a picture, but maybe in one path, but some other paths we may not even have touched, right? So those are some advantages, disadvantages, but I would say that this is a better approach uh, combining them. Now, uh, some example analysis tools that are available in the real world, I call them free source tools uh, or open source tools. Uh, you can download, you can install, you can try. Um, some have some documentations. Uh, some have very old documentations. You, you might run out of the lock if you want to try. But you, want, you can do some uh, trial. So uh, what we found is that most of the common tools, um, you have a question? So the data execution is one of the things called um, code execution. Um, so Android does not support that, actually. So the Android design feature, I think I have one of the slides, if you have to notice, that Android gives us a guarantee that uh, no buffer overflow is possible where you cannot exploit that kind of uh, situation, such as providing code into, as a data and running it back. Do you really need buffer overflows to do that? So um, what, um, if you allow me to continue my presentation, then can I come back on this? Um, Sorry, if you can clarify your question um, again for me. So, I feel like I'm in too much detail. Yeah, I mean, when you say, is it, I mean, if I get your couple of words correctly, that whether an Android where that remote code execution or code execution through input, right? Okay, so never mind. So you can, we can talk about that later. Um, so I will, uh, I will go back to my slide. Uh, so uh, many of those tools currently using the tainted data flow based um, analysis. So the key notion is a very simple one is you are trying to find a path between the source and the sinks. So what is the source here? Source are the inputs. So inputs are something that are coming externally from the environment. Sinks are the one that where those inputs are processed and those inputs might be stored in a file, those inputs might be used to run a query where SQL injection can happen, for example, or it can be sent to an external network, as another example, and so on and so on. So those are the places. Now, you find those paths. Remember, we talked in the static analysis part that you have to model your application in this case, right? So this is a complex process. So this is the place where the modeling is done, and you are trying to find those paths into the model. And here, you have one quick snapshot that I actually got from the Florida website. Is it basically shows that you have a main and a foo and inside the, inside the main, you basically created an object, and you pass that object, okay, you basically, uh, at some point, you assign that object to another object, and, and, and then you pass that initial object to a foo function, where that foo function got an external input into w, this w was assigned to x. And what implication it has is this x is referring to z, so this z was the parameter, right? So the z came from this a, Eventually, this is attainted because this external input is somehow affecting this A. That's the 
key idea. And then the sync is the one of the, this is a simple representation, but this could be uh, send an SMS, for example, or writing to a file and so on. So this is an example of a flow that's going to be discovered by the tools. Now, FlowDroid is a tool that is very popular, I would say. There are many papers out of there. It's a project currently maintained under uh, University of Paderborn, Germany. Um, this tool does a context, flow, field, object sensitive, life cycle hour, static chain analysis. Uh, I'm not going to talk all of them. Each of them can be explained. But life cycle is important for Android because life cycle basically dictates some of the methods that must take place in sequence. Okay, that's why the life cycle is important. And that helps to pres uh, generate more accurate uh, warning instead of in, uh, getting it uh, wrong, I would say. Uh, next is, um, actually, that Paderborn is in Germany, right? So in, in the US, the MIT did a project for a while. They call it Droid Safe. It's a static taint analysis tool, and this is the logo that is currently on their website. Uh, the, this tool was built, we believe, as part of a DARPA, which is a defense agency. So this is also basically a contract project. And as a matter of that, uh, what we see is that it's no longer maintained currently at this moment, but because of the contract nature, it has some strict uh, criteria or constraints. For example, it can analyze up to 50,000 line of code, and it supported the Android version until 4.4.1. So these days we have version nine, all right? So it's no, not very up to date, I would say. Uh, and it also has some limitations. For example, it cannot analyze the dynamic code loadings, uh, native code, and so on. Uh, now, uh, we, found, we wanted to show a demo on MoBSF. So at this moment, I'm going to transfer the discussion to the other speaker. Arvind, please. So he's going to talk the rest of the part. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ahmad Arvind Islam, and I'm working as a graduate research assistant under Dr. Hussain Sharia. Uh, right now, I'm going to talk about a dynamic and static analysis tool called Mobile Security Framework, in short, MobSF. MobSF is a dynamic and a static analysis tool. You can analyze any APK uh, by using this tool. MobSIF used uh, uses a isolated device or environment to inspect the IP APK, that what the vulnerabilities um, we can have in that APK. MobSIF is supported by Linux, Kali Linux, and Ubuntu 16.04. Uh, you can also run MobSIF in macOS, El Capitan, and High Sierra. And it is also supported by Windows 7 and Windows 10. And Python 3 is required for the scripting language, and uh, you have to upgrade the PEEP 3 to run MobSF properly. So now let's have a look. Uh, I did a dynamic and a static analysis using this MobSF tool, and I wanted to show it practically, but somehow the laptop is not working. So I have a presentation slide here. So let's move on to the dynamic approach. So here you can see that this is an isolated emulator, and I have installed a, a sus suspicious uh, APK file in the simulator by using this MobSF uh, uh, mobile security, you know, uh, the dynamic and the static analysis tool. This is the icon of this application, and apparently by Inspecting this icon, we can say this is a movie player, and it, it is supposed to play a video file from your device. But what it actually does, when I inspected the application and the MobSF tool generated the dynamic analysis report, what I found, let's, let's have a look on the next slide. Here is the dynamic analysis report of the previous application that I installed in the isolated emulator. In the back end, it actually tries to send a text message to a static number, which is 3354, and the number is hard-coded inside the code. In the later, we will look on the, hard, you know, the raw Java file. The static analysis report just gave us a raw Java file, in the, uh, Java file. So in the next slide, we will look on the raw code that the programmer basically hard-coded the uh, text, uh, the number, in the program to send a text message in the backend. So 
Apparently, by looking at the icon, we cannot say that what it actually does. But when you try to open the, open the application, in the back end, it tries to send this, uh, this message to a static number. And also, the application uh, creates a database in the device. So in an in a application which actually developed to play a movie file, there is no need to create a database. It doesn't make a sense. So we can say that it, it is not a good app. It might be a malware, but still we are not confirmed. We have to do some more analysis, and we have the report generated by the MobSF too. So let's, let's have a look on the next say, um, uh, slide. This is actually the application. When I installed and tried to open the application for the first time, it came up with a pop-up window uh, that, that needs a user interface to uh, choose a button that would you like to send a message to this number or not. There is, a, there, there is an option, like you can say, cancel the pop-up window too. But when the first time you cancel the pop-up window, it will come again. And second time, if you cancel the pop-up window, it will come again too, with a different number. So why this, uh, this is happening, we will see in the raw Java code later. So this is the static analysis report that the MobSF generated. So here we can see that the, the developer of this application using a dangerous permission, which is uh, send SMS. Actually, in Android, we have to declare some permission to do particular things. Like if you want to send SMS to a number, you have to declare the send SMS permission in the manifest file. And if you want to call to a, yes, please. So why didn't the OS just, why didn't the, why didn't the operating system just instantly kill the program when you deny it a permission? The operating system, it, the program itself, uh, the program itself kills, kills the program. The application I tested here, it doesn't do anything. When you... The parents, the program that the, started the program. Oh, the OS, you are talking about the operating system, the Android operating system, why it is not killing the uh, malware application. Yeah. yeah. There is no feature, but, you know, in Android OS, there is no feature of killing the malware itself. So because... Actually, the Android operating system doesn't kill the uh, application itself. You have to uninstall the application. Then the application will be removed from the device. So there is no feature like killing the application it itself in the OS, Android OS. Maybe you got, got the answer, I think. So, uh, sorry. So, this is the dangerous permission that uh, the application is uh, using inside the, inside the manifest file. So whenever you, try, you install an application, it, it needs the permission from you that this permission is going to, going to be used in the application. So during the installation, you will get a notification that the application will use your SMS permission. So most of the time, we actually ignore the permissions because we want to use the application in a, in, you know, we, we are in a hurry. So we want to install it quickly and we want to in, install it. So it is our awareness. So here you can see that uh, the, 
as I say, said earlier, that uh, the application also creates a database inside inside the program, inside the device, and it uses a raw SQL query, and who which is responsible for SQLite injection, the SQL injection problem. And SQLite, SQL injection basically helps the attacker to leak data from the device. We will see a, an example of SQL injection in the later slides. I have built a program to demonstrate the SQL injection problem. So this is the raw file, that uh, raw Java file, the mob is generated to analyze the line by line code inspection. Here you can see that uh, the program creates a raw text view at first, uh, a dynamic text view, text view, then the a character sequence, it is a text, you can say it is a, a string. Then the developer is putting the string in the text view. Then in the try catch block here, the developer tried to send the text masses to this static number. As I said earlier, that uh, the programmer uh, built, uh, you know, statically hard coded a static number to send a particular message. And why the pop up window came three times? Here you can see that the try catch block has been exec executed three times. And this is the this is the function call, and this function call actually saves the you know, result from the user interface in a database that I said earlier that the program is also creating a database inside the device. So this is the raw file. So you can inspect the raw Java file by using the Movisef tool. So Movisef is basically useful to test a Android application before installing in your device. So you can see that what the uh, application actually does. And if you are satisfied and you want to install it in your real device, then you can go for it. So this is why these tools are built for, and it is widely used in research and academia now these days to analyze uh, malware applications. Now, I want to present a hands-on demo on SQLite injection problem. That actually, I wanted to show it in the Real, uh, in the real run time in, the, in my laptop, but the HDMI port is not working, so I have to show the slides. So this is a this is a application. In this application, I have created a database, and there is a table named user table, and statically I have inserted some user information like username and password in the user table, and there is a user input you can see here, and there is a search button. So if you put up valid ID, and if you perform the search button, then the SQL query will execute, and it will show the result based on the ID. So if you, you know, put up valid ID, then it will show the username and password associated with the ID in the user table. So this is the raw SQL query, where I am selecting everything from the user table, and I am doing the matching on the user input. Here is the info, this is the user input and I'm appending the input with the query. So apparently the query uh, looks good and there is no problem because I, am look, I, I want to look for ID one and it produces the same correct result. So what is the problem then? The problem is if you put an invalid input like one or one, if, if any user puts an invalid input like one or one, which is a relational logic, and we know that it always produces a true value, then the raw SQL query dumps out the whole table. Actually, it gives the whole information from the database. So this is SQL injection. Like you are injecting a malicious statement to the SQL query, and you are dumping out the whole, data, uh, whole table from the database. To prevent this kind of SQL injection, you have to do, you have to perform the parameterized query. Here you can say that, okay, here in the next, uh, second line you can see that I am, you know, taking the input text and converting it to a string, a single string and putting it back to a, a string array which is uh, m underscore arg v. And this time, I'm performing the raw SQL query based on the ID number. 
I'm again selecting the user table, and this time I'm looking for which is the ID you want to perform the search. And it performs the search on the ID column of the user table. And this time I'm passing the argument as a complete string. So one or one is this time a complete string, and there is no such ID exist in the user table. Because when we create a uh, table in the database, we know we define the ID parameter as a auto-incremented integer number, and that cannot be null. And there is no such integer which is equivalent to one or one. So SQL injection is not possible in this case. So if you put a one or one invalid input, in this query, there will be no output because there is no ID equivalent to it. So this is a way to prevent the SQLite inje injection because we use SQLite database in Android application to save data. So in the next next uh, demo, I'll, I have a concept. Example, what, not to do? Sorry? That info null line, what not to do, so the sequence. The, the, the null line? Talking about the null null value. This uh, null parameter you are talking about. So what not to do? That's what the null is. Uh, can I repeat the question again? Sorry. <laughs> So this is the, the next, uh, in, the, in this demonstration app, I'm going to present the inter-app communication. It is an IPC problem that uh, we found in, in, a, in a research uh, last year. Actually, in Android, it is possible to pass data from one application to another application, the same device. And to pass data from one application to another application, we need an intent object. Intent is a built-in class we have in Android, which carries raw data from one application to another, and you can pass data from activity to activity by using this intent. You can also trigger an activity by this intent object. To catch an intent by filtering action name, you have to place a broadcast receiver in the manifest of the application, or you can you can start the broadcast receiver dynamically in the Java file too. The broadcast receiver basically filters the action name and depending on the action name, it catches the intent. And in Android, we have so many default action names and it is available in the developer.google.com site and we use this action name to send a message or to, to do a call I mean dial it, dialing a number, or if you want to write a file to external loca location or internal location, you have to pass this action name in the constructor of the intent object. When we initia initialize the intent object, we have to pass this action name as a constructor to the intent class. So in this demonstration, I have developed three application. One is the sender application, Second one is the legitimate receiver, and third one is the malware interceptor. So in the sender application, what I am trying to do, I am trying to send a username and a password to a res legitimate receiver app in the same device. So when I send the intent based on the action name, the legitimate receiver receives the data that the intent is carrying, and here you can see the toast message is showing the username and password that the receiver is intercepting the data. In this case, I just uh, pass the intent based on the action name. So, so far this is uh, look a secure communication, a secure inter-process communication, there is no problem. But the problem is if, if the attacker or the malware generator knows the action name, then the attacker can also place the same action name in the broadcast receiver of a malware interceptor. So what will happen then? The intent will be intercepted by the malware interceptor too without causing any problem in the sender and the receiver applications communication. 
So the legitimate receiver will receive the data too. At the, at the meantime, the malware interceptor will receive the data too because it has the action name in its uh, broadcast receiver. To protect this kind of malware interception, I just came up with a new idea, which is a permission, a custom defined permission in the manifest. So you, what you have to do, you have to de declare a customized permission in the manifest of the sender file, of the sender applications file. And I put the protection level as a signature level because we are actually validating a signature between two applications, like the sender application and the re legitimate receiver. Then I declared the permission in the manifest of the, Android, uh, of the sender application. And this time, I'm sending the intent with the permission. This is the custom permission that I declared in the manifest. So this time, I'm sending the intent not alone. I'm passing the permission to. Here you can see that uh, the action name I have passed in the intent object when initializing, and this is the custom permission. So what will happen then? Only the re legitimate receiver will receive the data because you have to declare the same permission in, this, uh, in the legitimate receiver's manifest. Either the receiver will not match the permission that the intent is carrying when the receiver application will match the permission with the sender, it will get the username and password. And in this case, the malicious application or the malware interceptor will not have the permission because it is, it is the developer who knows the permission what actually he's sending from the sender application. So this is the technique, you can say a two-factor authentication to pass the data from one application to another. So this project is basically funded by NSF, and we are currently working on dynamic analysis approach. And now I want to take over to the Dr. Hossein Sharir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think that's pretty much it. Uh, so to conclude, we have seen that uh, this Android, it's, um, it has a lot of things going on. So we have malware, adware, spyware, and so on. And it's on top of millions of apps, even though I would say 0.1% are those. It's a good number. Can affect lots of people, cause a lot of um, uh, issues, uh, financial loss, I would say. Um, and logging your activities is something we probably don't want. Um, and it's very hard to find a very silver bullet to solve or detect everything like in one shot. It's not really that easy. Um, so sometimes um, we see that, for example, the static analysis, it looks interesting, but it comes with false positive warnings. So, and dynamic analysis, we have seen that it has a limited capability, even though it's accurate. Uh, so I think we can, we wanted to do the best, so we wanted to have all those approaches. And remember, it's on top of the built-in security features provided by the Android, and we see that it has not really necessarily Recording all those features are absolutely, sometimes they become irrelevant when it comes to the malware, adware, spyware on top of those uh, devices. Uh, so I think that's basically concluding the discussion for now. It's an ongoing project. Uh, so and thank you again for attending, everybody. If you have any questions, you can uh, talk Thanks. to me offline. Thank you so much.